All right, so welcome everyone. We'll give you a moment to get connected. And if you are in front of the, the computer or phone, I encourage you to uh, be with us and ask questions and it's great to see your face. Um, but uh, I'm here uh, with Andy, Stewart, and Chabert. And this is on the topic of European climbing physios. And I'm excited to, to talk through any questions. We had a lot of questions submitted uh, in advance um, and to pick their brains as well. I'm a little, a little curious myself as there's always differences too geographically um, with how we manage climbers and, and so forth. Um, so uh, I think we'll just get started with introductions. We have a lot of questions uh, that were submitted, but whoever's here now, if you have questions, I say keep this as interactive as possible. You can drop them in the chat. Um, you can kind of stay engaged that way and we'll monitor the chat as well. Um, but I'll just start, we can just start with introductions. So um, we'll start with, with Andy. Can you kind of introduce yourself and kind of how you've got to where you are now? <laughs> yeah, I'll try and keep that short. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Andy, Andy McVitie. Uh, I am, I am process physiotherapy there is just me uh, I am now a full-time climbing physiotherapist which I never thought would be uh, it's kind of it's morphed and evolved uh, since lockdown really um, lifelong climber been climbing for sort of 30 years now um, and always helped friends and what have you with injury that kind of thing and then when lockdown happened and my work and the world got a bit turned upside down started branching off into climbing physiotherapy and yeah now I make a full-time job out of it which is great nice and um Stuart yeah so I'm I'm Stuart um I'm from the UK but I live in Tyrol in Austria and um, just uh, west of Innsbruck and I have a practice in a, a valley where there's loads of skiing uh climbing and uh some mountain biking um, I see a lot of climbers, but I see a lot of ACL ruptures, uh, slap lesions, um, back problems, um, and I am a climber, so I've climbed uh, quite quite some time now. Uh, I used to compete, uh, but now I'm just a, a rock climber. Here, Jared. Hi. <laughs> Don't quiet. Jaber, is it hey, your go? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna introduce myself. Yeah. Can you can you listen to me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I'm Jaber Rilletaoena. I'm from north of Spain. Okay. So I'm a climber as well, and I'm a, a climbing physiotherapy almost full-time and also a university professor so yeah i mostly do sport climbing and that's all so yeah i i love fully injuries so yeah i spend a lot of time doing ultrasound for fully injuries and i think that that's all so yeah i think we've just lost jared's audio a bit can you hear me now? Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Back in action. All right. So thank you, uh, each of you, for sharing. Um, and, you know, I think what's really cool is there's like three different kind of spread geographic regions, you know, that each of you, you know, practice in. And your training, um, you know, has some differences as well. And so I think there's some clinical questions people have asked and there's some practice-based questions. And I'll just start shooting them off. And maybe if someone wants to take one, we can kind of build on it. Um, but I, I think this is an interesting one because as, you know, you clinicians that work with climbers, we see a lot of different body regions, but the hand and fingers are one that typically we don't get as much training in our standard, you know, physiotherapy school. So this was a question um, how did you get mentorship 
or learn about the fingers of the hand, it's often a topic that's only brushed upon in PT school. Um, so someone, you know, kind of want to share how you became comfortable with treating that body region. <laughs> Go ahead, so that I, I have a, a quick step. Um, in as much as, yeah, I, I was a bit disappointed at physio school and it's quite interesting to me to, to hear it. It seems to be not just in the UK because, you know, the sort of study kind of stopped about here <laughs> and uh, we, we learned some muscles and then that was it uh, and as a climber I was pretty interested in the hand and I was like oh we're not we're not covering that then um, it's a specialism normally for occupational therapists in this country um, how do you learn about it saying you learn about any other part of anatomy um, you know the, the the information and the research is out there people are out there I found the physio community or the occupational therapy community just you know, um, really welcoming, opening. They always tend to like to chat about stuff, get in touch with people, make contact with the hand therapist, go and shadow them, speak to them. Uh, you know, everyone's pretty willing to talk and share, I think, really. Um, but yeah, and then relating that practical, theoretical knowledge <clears throat> to what you know about climbing is what I've found to be the, you know, the, the key, really, for treating hands and overuse or acute injury and that type of thing. Yeah, I think this is a good question maybe for all three of you, just because it's an interest in how each of you have become, I think, comfortable in that region. I think my, my um, interest in it started with uh, Falker, the Schiffel, all his research and his books. Um, and I was kindly invited to present in Manchester, at one of the injury symposiums back in 2014 um, about a, a pulley protocol. And there was nothing out there about how you progressively um, load a, a ruptured um, pulley to a system. And that just basically exploded my interest in that area. And yeah, it's just, just continuing. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that my experience is quite of the same. I had a pulley injury, like, I don't, I don't remember, but it was like 10 years ago, and I realized going to different physios that there was not much information about it. So, yeah, I love research, and I start reading a lot of papers, and then discovered, I discovered uh, Volker Shelf as well. He was so, well, he is actually so, so inspiring for me. And, yeah, I think that... Yeah, I started reading all the papers. I was really motivated about it. So I decided to start start with uh, ultrasound diagnosis research. And I think that, yeah, I'm just learning by myself because I didn't find any special course or any special formation about this topic. So yeah, I think that that's my experience. I mean, I think that that's it, isn't it? We're kind of, <laughs> we're, we're almost experimenting, you know, um, and yeah. that's it's, it's such a, a new, a new uh, world, uh, how to treat so uh, pulling injuries, uh, tendon, finger tendon, tendon injuries with climbers, and obviously the the research is, yeah, we, we need to write it. <laughs> um, yeah. and it's exciting. I so there's I, a, I see, go oh, no go for sorry. it. Um, a pulling protocol from the it was from the GB. Um, team actually Stu from I believe about nine years ago now I think just when I think when I when I caught sight of it and it was basically is it sore yes rest two weeks is it still sore yes rest a further four weeks is it still sore yes rest for eight <laughs> weeks and that went on for over six months until they said refer to a hand specialist and it's just like <laughs> isn't it yes international level competitors were being told sit down for six months and, and do nothing and yeah. Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, I think it's great where we're at now. And then, you know, and yeah, that, that was just, that was like just nine years ago. Yeah. Just yeah. imagine how far we've come. Yeah. And hopefully the research will follow soon. I know there's a lot of studies going on, you know, to try and determine, you know, best load times, protocols, etc. cetera. So, um, all right, here's another question. Um, this one I'm interested in as well. Uh, what are your must have, these are in quotes, 
must have or go to tools for assessing and treating climbers. So we, we all know we can assess and treat climbers um, with just, you know, one on one, no additional tools parameters needed. Um, and I, I think that's important just to state off the bat is really it's this and this, right? Our brain and our eyes, which is primary. Um, but are there specialized tools or things that you use that you find can supplement um, in any of your assessments? And I think it's a good one for everyone as well to, to kind of answer. We're all so shy. Go ahead, <laughs> Should I go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Reverse alphabetical okay. order. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to be repetitive because I'm all the time speaking about ultrasound and ultrasound, so I don't want to be repetitive. But yeah, but yeah, I would say that for me, it's a really interesting tool. So I would say what I'm using right now is a force sensor, you know, for finger strength. So what I'm looking for is uh, when does the pain appear, okay? So when you, for example, we did a research and for me, the best grip is the one finger crimp, okay? I think that it's quite a reliable grip for pull injuries. So imagine that uh, the one patient or one climber is coming and I always ask him just to put in the force sensor and imagine that it's like, when does the pain appear? So it's like two kilograms, okay. And the next time when it's coming again, I do exactly the same protocol. So I'm seeing how it's evolving. So I'm doing like a control exam. And then on the other way, I would say that for me, the ultrasound for uh, initial diagnosis is really, really important. Yeah, that's my main two tools for a good diagnosis, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We, what about you? <laughs> we're in Austria, unfortunately, the physios are officially not allowed to perform ultrasound. Um, which is crazy, <laughs> but I think it's changing. It's going to change. I'm desperate to get into all that, into the ultrasound. Um, so I, yeah, basically I, I'm working with doctors in Innsbruck who then provide a diagnosis. Uh, um, so I've not actually got my hands on the on ultrasound machine yet. Um, but I, yeah, the, the, the tin deck. So that gives me yeah. some objective, uh, objective measurements. Um, and yeah, still subjective, obviously. Swelling, uh, how much swelling do we have? Um, but yeah, I'm desperate to get into uh, ultrasound. So I might come over to Spain soon. I'll, I'll come over to Spain and have a course with you. <laughs> okay, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might have two people coming on your course. Cause yeah, I, I too, I, yeah, I'm not, uh, I don't do ultrasound. Uh, I would really like to, I think there is good um, I, I don't feel I do my patients a disservice by not having ultrasound. Obviously, it's always there if, I, if I'm unsure. But things like the research from Kerry Cooper, I think it's quite reliable, quite uh, repeatable um, into assessing A2 pulleys um, without ultrasound. Uh, but again, yeah, Tindec is just what used to be hundreds of pounds or, you know, euros to, to, to test this kind of thing is now, you know, yeah, very, very cheap, really. Um, I have a, a patient now, but it's actually somebody I used to coach and she's at university doing an engineering degree and, and she's making me one that will measure all four fingers. But once she was like, it's simple, I could do that. I was like, I had no idea how you can, how you can do this. But yeah, she's, she's making one for me. Just these, these benchmark Measures are, are really important, aren't they? They certainly give an idea of severity, um, but then progress as well. And interesting, I don't know if you just said it by random, Chipper, but uh, yeah, two kilos seems to be what I often see when somebody, yeah, they, they go two kilos out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I totally agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I have a, another little, um, uh, I think called um, active force, uh, which people can push against. You know, I, I hold it in my hand. It's like a, a dynamometer. It's the word I was looking for. But again, it's like a hundred pounds instead of a thousand pounds. Yeah, it works really, really well. And I would say as well, uh, the My Jump app. Um, yeah, absolutely fantastic for looking at things like 
power fade, uh, rate of force development, all, all sorts of interesting things you can do with that for the upper limb as well as the lower limb. So yeah, the, the My Jump app, have a look at that. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how technology, especially for clinicians, is getting more price point affordable. And then it's easier to use to supplement some of our kind of clinical reasoning and tests that we can feel, but it's nice to then have a number or nice to then have an image um, to support it. Um, here's another interesting one. The question is, how do you specialize in, or how, how did you specialize in rock climbing PT after PT school? Um, you know, I think this is interesting as maybe as, as people are listening or, or watching and, and maybe imagine they're in a clinic and they're seeing a couple of climbers, like, how do you make that? How did you make that jump or transition from maybe seeing a few climbers? to now this is a population that you see quite a bit. Um, and maybe like in short form, like, you know, kind of soundbite form is like, what, what, what was the story? Like what happened? Um, to, and maybe that can encourage, it's scary, right? It's scary to transition from a general population to just seeing a high percentage of one, um, you know, both financially and also, um, you know, specializing. So yeah, maybe does anyone want to share maybe how that transition occurred? Yeah, <laughs> I think it's, um, it was, it was going to happen, you know, I was, I've, I've been a climber uh, all my life and, and I was training really intensive for the uh, World Cups back then. Um, and your training knowledge improves as well you know, when you're training yourself and you have contact with coaches and trainers, other physios, and you kind of just gain the experience and the uh, confidence to, to start treating uh, a lot of climbers. Because you know what's going on, you know how what, what the movement pattern is, and you know how to improve certain issues in 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 the climber's movement pattern. I think for myself, practically, if if that's what people are, are talking about, it was, you know, it's climbing. It, one of the things we we love, I think, about climbing is the community. Um, and so making that step for me was was small and fairly low risk in that I started a small part time practice in a local climbing gym uh, where I, I knew the owners. They know me. We have done for years and they were like they offered me this this space. They said, we think it's going to be good for our patients. No financial outlay for you. And I had a little space and I could dip my toe in and see how it worked. Um, so it doesn't have to be. You know, and then gradually that, you know, that part time got bigger and bigger and my other work got smaller and smaller until I felt able to change. Um, but community is, is the thing. It, it's, you know, it's word of mouth. It's people knowing you, trusting you, knowing that you're a climber and you understand all the things, you know, that Stu was saying and, and what they want. You can understand their goals and, uh, yeah, and what they want to achieve. Um, I was at Malham Catwalk yesterday, Stu, which, which you'd know. Um, and I everybody on, on the catwalk is maybe bad uh, I, I treated apart from two people there was two people there that I, <laughs> I hadn't treated uh, and it just suddenly struck me I was like wow climbers get injured a lot was my first thought actually uh, but it, it's that community um, you will get known you will get and word will spread and it will grow so if you want to do it I say just go for it I think it's just to add to that you almost get forced into the uh, situation of having to treat climbers. Yeah. If you go down to the wall and they find out that you're a physiotherapist, that's it. Yeah. yeah. People just come yeah. at you. <laughs> and and I, I started, I used to do very informal, like, let's have a chat, whatever. And, and then really, it, it can't, you've got to do a proper. And so I would say to someone, I will treat you for free. You know, we're, we're mates, we're friends, whatever. Um, but we need to do this properly. Let's book a three quarters of an hour, an hour or whatever. And then it's strange, often then they wouldn't. Yeah, even though you're offering them the, the, the full the full deal, really. I found that strange. But then when you set yourself up and start asking for payment, then suddenly it starts working. I don't, don't know what that's about. People, yeah. Yeah, I think that it's much of the same for me. I have uh, a pretty similar experience. So I think that 
we are climbers, we love climbing. So, you know, I think that, you know, almost all the climbers in your area, they know that you're a physiotherapist because they are asking all the time to you. Do you have the same feeling? <laughs> so, yeah, I think that, yeah, it's much of the same. But for me, my personal, in my personal experience, it's really enriching to have your own experience with injuries. For example, two years ago and three years ago, I had two different uh, pulley injuries, A4 pulley ruptures, a complete ruptures. So I think that it's really important to feel by yourself, you know, yourself, how is the pain? How is the, the reduction of your, of your mobility? How is your strength deficit? How is your, your feeling? I mean, you know what you are feeling. So when a climber is com coming to, to my clinic with, with this injury, I think that they feel really comfortable and they calm down when they know that you are, when you know what's that feeling. And I think that's really important. So yeah, I think that the best point of having injuries of suffering of injuries, of climbing injuries, is that you can share your experience in the clinic. So I, I think that it's really useful. All right, we'll dive into some clinical questions. Um, and these may be, maybe one of you will answer, you know, or if you wanna jump on it, multiple can. Um, this one's a little bit more broad. Uh, what are some of the areas that you see a critical lack of research that affects your ability to treat climbers well? So, and to flip that on the other side, basically what research do we need to start doing uh, be, that we're lacking in right now? Um, we don't know answers to. So is there any, any, I, I, I want think, to, to that? Yeah, that will be obviously well-placed regarding the, the literature and, and research. But one thing for me that I think we missed that I've not seen in, in, in any country or being able to find is guidelines for youth climbers. Every sport I can think of, basketball, baseball, cricket, you know, they will say they will have age groups or size groups. They will have, you can play a competitive game once a week. You can train for two hours at this intensity. This is what we know is healthy for this age group. And in climbing so far, we have nothing. We have children dropped off at the climbing gyms, yeah, like 14, 15 over summer holidays. And they're there for eight hours while their parents are at work every day climbing. Stu probably did the same. Um, yeah, and that, that for me is something I'm I'm quite passionate about that we need, but that's my. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think in my opinion, I would say that conservative treatment, I would, I think that we need more research about different injuries, conservative treatment. For example, for fully conservative injuries, we have information about splints. We have information about rehabilitation after the surgery, but we don't have much information about how to treat conser conservatively a, a partial pulley rupture, which is, I would say, quite a common injury. So yeah, I think that this is quite necessary in the future, in the near future. Yeah, that's my opinion. What do you All think, Steve? Yes, do it. Yeah. Any, uh, anything that you want the research on and then we'll, we'll, uh, record this and look back in five years and there needs to be that that'll be the stimulus for a, a multi-site study. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I need to be careful. <laughs> do, do we, do we need the fully ring or not? Yeah, brilliant, right? Yeah. Easy study, easy, easy yeah. study. How yeah. though? How 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 can we how can we test that? Because we we, we think it's probably necessary. The pulley ring is there so, efficacy more more psychological than physical? You know, and and is that a bad thing in something that doesn't really have any side effects? Or that, yeah, yeah. No, I I provide them. I use them. Um, I'm sort of a fan of them, but also I've I've seen plenty without and, and recover well and, and good healing. So yeah, and yeah. Just I'm, for context, we all know there's excellent research that shows if you use a pulley ring, you have successful outcomes. But there's not comparative to say if you didn't use the ring, would you also have those successful outcomes? I think Stuart, that's what you're you're jumping mm -hmm. on. Exactly. Yeah. 
Because a lot of be older honest. climbers who could probably tell you that they did rupture a pulley and their finger is okay. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, in my opinion, uh, I share this this opinion with Volker many times, and uh, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, in the clinic, I never use uh, pulley rings in A4 pulley ruptures, never, mm -hmm. because I think that I have 30, 40 subjects, 30, 40 climbers uh, using the team deck mm -hmm. and using the tenable distance. So I'm following this information or these measurements, and I'm seeing that in the in like in three to six months, the result, the functional result, is the same. So honestly, I think that is a, a good option for a future study. So if you want to join, I would be really yeah. happy. Honestly, yeah, yeah, cool. Why not? Why not? Um, all right, good. Shaking things up a little bit too with, um, with, some, with some clinical questions. Um, here's one with uh, movement analysis. Um, you know, do you do any movement analysis with climbers or do you send them to a coach or do you view video? Like how do you get an idea of how climbers climb? Um, and is that important in, <clears throat> in your practice? Jared, I really like your presentation in uh, Bamber. Well, it, it was in Frank and Jura. Do you remember last summer? I yeah, really yeah. like this this presentation because I think that I, I have to learn a lot from you about the movement patterns. It was really interesting, honestly. And here in the clinic, we are working with a general orthopedic uh, doctor and then with a sports, uh, well, a sports science uh, and climbing injuries expert about uh, exercise and all that stuff and yeah when i have a suspicion of a movement uh, problem or i mean a discompensation or if there is like you know any problem in your chain yeah i always uh, speak with him because i think that it's really really important we have a lot of injuries and a lot of pains and maybe the problem is not in the hand maybe you're your problem is in the shoulder or in the elbow or whatever. So yeah, I think that's a really good question. And um, I've definitely, I've certainly noticed a pattern over the, the over the years um, with like a, a general shoulder shoulder weakness, uh, shoulder retraction or a scapular retraction problem, uh, leading to, to certain elbow issues. Um, so I think it's, and eventually finger issues. So I think it's almost essential that we do some movement analysis. Um, just watch them hanging on a fingerboard, watch, watch the patients do a pull up, uh, see what's happening when, they, when they're climbing. Is the, is the pelvis moving enough? Um, is, is the pelvic, the, the, the pelvis uh, impulse present? Um, just that kind of, that kind of stuff. Yeah, same. I, I was not not as a something you do every single time, but there's certainly yeah, there's some people that present and you're thinking, is there something you know going on here? Totally agreed, Stu. Shoulders um, definitely seem to set us up for issues further down the chain, and that makes sense. That you know they're, they're the main connection, aren't they? Um, I, yeah, I, and so I do do some myself. I feel confident enough to do that. I coached for a, a long time. Um, and so I feel not only can I spot these things, I can give people the cues to, because that's a, an entire skill in itself. I'm sure, Stu, you're there with that as well. Um, but I'm also fortunate, I, I think you know him, Jared, uh, to have John Kettle, um, is a you know, technical climbing coach. He lives just up the road. He's a climbing partner of mine and what have you. And, and so it, it's, yeah, you know, I can refer them on for him as a very safe pair of hands. Um, and I do, but I do think you know climbing technique as just evening out peaks and troughs of load. You know, in general, if you can climb smoothly rather than snappy and grabby and what have you, it's, it's a win, isn't it? And uh, here's a question. Um, maybe I'll put this twofold. Do you have any favorite resources, books, journals, articles? 
um, that you think are important for PTs or physios to read about climbing? And then I'll add to that, are there any resources that you use? Like how do you stay up to speed or stay up to date? Or are there any things that help facilitate like your knowledge um, with, with climbing too? So if any of you wanna share anything that, that you use or anything that you recommend for, for PTs and it can be anything that's out there. The Climbing Doctor blog. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it too. I mean, it's, it's other, the, the goal of that's a platform, right? And so it's for yeah. um, physical therapy students and physical therapists to share their, their information. Um, but Andy, you're, I mean, I, I think for, I mean, you can mention your book as well. I mean, I think there's, there's really good resources. I think you kind of start with that. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I, I do have a, a book out. Yeah. The self rehabbed climber. Um, but you know, what, what do I use? Where do I get, I, I find it particularly important to keep up to date with what people are doing to themselves, if that makes sense. So if, you know, the uh, Ned Feely's book, Beast Making, when that came out, I bought that for personal interest, but also because I know people are going to be using this book. You know, Steve Bechtel, I like a lot, is just do the basics, keep things simple. That's, I think, what what a lat is talking about now, what's, what's, you know, interesting there and that kind of thing, or what's current. Um, and that's just across, you know, this is not talking research and that type of thing. It's just what's going on in the climbing world. And you need to keep up with that, I think, because you'll see the fashions and the trends. And then a few months later, we get sometimes the results of that. <laughs> Yeah, any, Stuart or Shaver, is there anything that like, you know, obviously we learn a lot from our climbing patients. Like that's, at least for me, I could say that's where I learn a ton is they'll come in and I'll be like, oh, I haven't seen or heard that. And that'll be like a new, new kind of avenue. Um, do either of you have any ways you kind of stay up to speed or is it just through the reps, just seeing more patients or seeing new injuries? I think that it's quite of the same you have already said. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Uh, regarding books, I would like to to stress out that for me, the climbing medicine book of Volker and Issa Schultz, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. I think that a really interesting update of all the all the papers and all the studies about climbing injuries. So I think that it's a really great book. Then also uh, I use a lot uh, your book, Jared, for climbers, because they find all the exercises and all the protocols for each injuries. So I think that, for example, the climbing medicine book is really useful for PDs. And I use your book a lot for climbers because it's quite easy it to read, if it's okay to say that, Jared. And I think that it's, it's really, really useful because you have all the exercises and all the protocols for each injury. So I find it really interesting, yeah. yeah. Back in the day, there was the uh, Schweitzer Andreas. Maybe you know that book. I think it was like at the same time as uh, Volker's uh, One Move Too Many. Right. And that was also a really good, uh, really good book. And if you maybe know that one. Um, I think it's Vertical, Secret Vertical Secrets. Something like that. Um, but I agree. So, Andy, so just immerse yourself in all this information out there and then just find your own way through it um, with obviously your own experience and treating loads of patients. Yeah, there's, it sounds, there's so much out there and so many different ideas and viewpoints. And that's kind of the pretty amazing thing about where the sport is right now. Um, all right, uh, the most common climbing injury that you see. Maybe this is maybe a 10 second answer, but where most common one that you see, and it's sometimes season dependent, I'm assuming. But um, what, what's the most common? I would say pulley injury, lumbricalis tear. And then I would say maybe a lot of slaps. I would say that that's my other, yeah. Yeah, probably 50-50 between 
I'd say hand and shoulder. But not that not that they're all of them, but I, I think they're the the number one and two. I wouldn't I don't I wouldn't know which was in the lead. But yeah. I would say A4 ring finger on the undercut crimps. And then I would say Tino, Tino Sinovitis, slap lesions, and recently a lot of TFPC. Right. Mm -hmm. So these big slopers and uh, things are changing, aren't they? Yeah. I think if we're getting, yeah, I, yeah, now you mention it, I'm seeing quite, you know, do see quite a lot of TFC slap. And hip joints. Mm. Yeah. Uh, He'll doing, doing the splits. Yeah, setting yeah, is changing it's... things that, yeah. And for All me right. personally, it's a nightmare, the medial epicondyl tendinopathy of the elbow, especially yeah. in experimented climbers. For me, that's a nightmare because it's a really long injury. I love it. It's a bit... <laughs> <laughs> it's my, my, my favorite. <laughs> yeah, All right. Tendinopathy. Right. Sometimes. There's a lot you can do with it, isn't there? So you, yeah, you just, yeah, 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 I like can, it. You can move into like the shoulder, what, what's happening in the shoulder, and the, the thoracic spine, what's going on there. Yeah, Find rotation, it. super important, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. What is the hardest climbing injury to treat? Shaber may have answered this one, but for, uh, yeah, but for each of you, what is, <laughs> For you, what is the hardest one to treat? Whether it's you know not as much comfort with it, or it's just a difficult injury that takes a long time, or whatever it is, what's the hardest injury for you to treat from a climber? I think I think this, this TFCC. That's, that seems difficult. It seems like yeah. we. Like a lot of people seem to miss that um, window of opportunity. They they just keep trying to do a little bit more, and it just gets worse and worse. And then we're kind of stuck. It gets really chronic, um, and we're just stuck to these. You know, we have to stick to these isometric wrist exercises, and it's really hard to progress without causing pain. You just think how complex the the wrist. Uh, um, movements are during a, a climbing uh, move. There's so much going on there. Uh, and slow so healing as well, well, isn't it? And I, I've had a few, my own included, uh, when I'd forgotten all about it, you know, and then just suddenly, bosh, it's there again. Um, so it takes you by surprise and you're like, ah, oh, you know, I'd literally forgotten all about that. wasn't no anxiety around it anymore, but it, it's back. For a couple of weeks, you don't know. Is it just a, a little or is it back? Um, so, yeah, I think they are tricky to, to manage. I'll ask another question. I'll just fire some of these off. Um, percentage. What percentage of climbers do come in for prehab or for performance? And what percentage come in for injuries? Prehab. <laughs> Climbing, I think... Certainly, uh, it, it's still such a, a, a naive, youthful sport, by which I mean it's not mature. It's not, you know, triathletes, um, swimmers, just have it, they're all about, they will prehab. They, 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 they know the value of it. You know, I'm sure we all know what we mean by that term. Um, but essentially, you know, strength and conditioning and, and, and that type of thing. Um, yeah. I, I get people will want, want to not get injured again but they've already come to me in the first place about an injury. Maybe that's just UK climbers. I don't know. It's just you and your bear, I think. Yeah. So occasionally work with the national youth team over here. Um, was, I definitely predominantly treat injuries in the practice. Um, and occasionally some of the national athletes come up and we have a look you know do some do some prehab uh but it's yeah I, I think it's changed isn't it so like 10 years ago our knowledge um 
was definitely not as it is now. Um, and people are definitely, they, 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 they know that if you have a certain amount of shoulder robustness, that's actually going to help your, um, your performance on the wall as well. Um, and I think that actually the athletes are learning that themselves. Um, and they, they, they and treat another, it as a... It's another gap potentially in knowledge, isn't it? Because it, even any overhead research that I come across, it's handball, um, it seems to be a really common one in this kind of thing, and they have injury prevention. Os grew, I think it's called, something like that, it was a big study they did that had very poor adherence and very small changes. And But even then they couldn't say, was it the mobility? Was it the strengthening? Was it the reaction times that, that reduced injury? We just, it's, we just don't know, do we? <laughs> so yeah, there's another area, have it, yeah some proof about injury. We know things like the FIFA uh, 11 plus, their warm up uh, and injury prevention that they do. That, that has been a dip when it's adhered to is just, you know, amazing stuff they get for injury prevention. Uh, so there's definitely something in it, but relating that to climbing, I think is what we need to do somehow. I would say that in yeah, sorry, Jared. Yeah, go for it. No, go for it. Go for it. I would say that I'm just seeing. I, uh, yeah, I think that the ninety per. Yeah, well, I would say the ninety percent of the climbers that are, that are coming to my clinic, they are coming with injuries. If they are without pain, they are always climbing in the rock. So yeah, it's that easy. They just want to climb. So if they are all with a lot of pain, they are coming. If not, they continue climbing. It's that easy. All right. So we're gonna have... does the, they carry on climbing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right. Um, all right. So we're gonna have one last question, um, and this is you know for each of you, you know for people listening, watching, you know many of them are looking to get more involved with treating climbers and seeing them more often and improving their skills. So do you have any kind of last piece of advice or anything that you could kind of recommend for someone who's looking to treat this population um, and um, kind of become a climbing physiotherapist? Um, any kind of last final thoughts or words of encouragement? <laughs> I would say dissect the climbing movement. So just analyze as many different climbs as you can do. Uh, think about how you climb, how it feels. Um, improve your own proprioception. Uh, and obviously learn the anatomy. <laughs> um, think about what's actually going on in every move. Like which, what, what's working, you know. Yeah, I, I think if you're a, a, a PT and you have your principles that, that you know that you apply to every assessment and, and, and injury treatment, you're always going to be able to do some good for someone. So don't think that just because they're climbers, you that's somehow totally different. There are some differences, obviously, but it, it's not. You're always going to be able to, to do some good. So go and start learning. You know, make sure you, you, you do no harm and refer on if you're not sure. But yeah, go go do it. It's a fascinating growing area. So yeah, get into it. Yeah, I, I agree totally. I mean, yeah, I think that you need a lot of motivation and just go for it. Climb as much as you can. Learn as much as you can about the papers and all the books and just listen to your body and yeah, just go for it. I think that that's all, yeah.